Uh, it's going to be a quick message. <laughs> the framers were not set before I got through the game. If you will, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I do want to say thank you for the invitation. We appreciate being able to be here. This is definitely pulpit is a lot taller than the other ones I'm used to. So <laughs> you see me start swaying because I'm too hot off the ground. First uh, Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1, the, the Bible says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Do you know that you were Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols, even as you were led? Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God called Jesus accursed, and that Amen. no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Amen. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gift of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse or diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one in the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if an ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, but yet one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble and necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon these, we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. For one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular, and God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, yet I show you, show unto you a more excellent way. Let's pray. Amen. Dear Lord, I come before you and ask for your help, dear Lord, with this message. You would give me the words that I have, dear, that I need, dear Lord. And that you would uh, help me deliver them, dear Lord. And for those uh, that are listening, dear Lord, I ask you to help them to be able to receive the words, not because of their mind, dear Lord, but because of, your, of you, because of you. I ask for your help and guidance in this, and all those things. I pray. Amen. Amen. It's a long passage to read this morning, and I'm sorry about that, but also I'm not. <laughs> We're going to try to break it down in, in chunks and verses, but I wanted to read all of it together before we dissect it, if you will. Now this passage of scripture can be kind of um, divisive to some people. I've met people on both sides of the spectrum. Um, I've met some people who believe that as spiritual gifts are no longer in effect. You don't have to worry about that. Just get that chapter and keep going. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've seen some people who believe spiritual gifts are the only chapter you should read in the Bible. And mm -hmm. you know, that's all you need. Um, as a matter of fact, I worked with a guy one time. Uh, he said he was a pastor or preacher. I don't know. Uh, never went to one of the services. But he believed, uh, especially in the gift of miracles, because whenever somebody was sick, he would go breathe on a cloth, stick it underneath their pillow, and he said they would be better. And I never told him, but anytime I hear something like that, I always think, brother, why would, well, if you could do that, why wouldn't you go to a wholesale pack of 
of uh, handkerchiefs and go to the hospital. <laughs> you know, why wouldn't, why wouldn't you heal everybody? Because that's what the apostles did, didn't they? When yeah. they went into a city, they, they healed all, everybody, and everybody right. came to them to be healed. Now, that's one side of the spectrum, and then you have the other side. And where, where do we fall? And I think we're supposed to be somewhere in the middle. Right. I believe in spiritual gifts. I believe that these are still here today. Amen. Now, whether or not this is a comprehensive list, I don't know. <laughs> because I believe that gifts that we receive from, from God in spiritual gifts um, can be different things. So, such as, I, I do not have the gift of music or singing. I want to. I like it, but I don't. There are other people who are much better than me. They just are born, and they just have the ear, and they can play, and then that's it. And that's a spiritual gift if they use it for the Lord, right? Amen. So is, it, is, that, is that just a subset of the gift of knowledge? They just have the knowledge of music? I don't know. I guess you can make an argument for that if you will. But this chapter 12 is also connected to chapters 13 and 14. And we're going to talk a little bit about 13 at the end here. But this is... The first is this, these passages are to the church of Corinthians, mm -hmm. and they're directed to the church concerning these things. Now, if you work with me back in verses 1 through 3, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. This was a new church. They didn't know everything, did they? Right. You know that you were Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols, even as you were led. You're going you're gonna to lean towards what you've been taught, haven't you? Right. It's a Spanish ministry. You talk to these people who were raised in Mexico and their whole life, they've either been Catholic or Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. And that's what they lean towards. There's one guy, uh, his wife has passed away, but he talks about he would go to church in Mexico. And I don't, he was raised Catholic, but she was Pentecostal. And he says, My wife was in a talky talky religion. <laughs> that's what he says. <laughs> And uh, he doesn't understand that, but if you talk about Peter and Mary, he's right there with you. And that's what he believes, right. because that's what he's been taught his whole life. And such were we, and Gentiles, carried away into these dumb idols. And what else is the statue of Mary and Peter and all these people? They're nothing but dumb idols. Amen. Like, Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit calls Jesus a curse. How many religions do we see today that say Jesus Christ didn't exist here? He's a good fellow, but don't worry about it. Right. It says here, wherefore I understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse. You can know that the, you can check the Bible. These people aren't led of the Spirit to be knocking on your door, are they? Amen. And that no man can say Jesus is, is the Lord saved by the Holy Ghost. There you go. You can't say that Jesus is Lord with conviction until you've been saved, can you? Amen. Because until you're saved, it's just a head knowledge, not a heart knowledge. Verse 4 says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And that's a, that's a theme in this chapter, the first part, the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but in the same God, which worketh all in all. Each, the churches here are local, visible churches, aren't they? Amen. And how we all do business here is a little different than how we do business in Julian. It's a little bit different than how they do business in Clarksville. And it's a little different than I saw how they do it in Murray. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean that one of us is wrong and one of us is right? Does that mean we're all wrong and everyone else has it right? I don't think so. It's a local church. Amen. Every one of us can have a little different operation, a little different administration, mm -hmm. but in the same spirit. Right. Now, if you go preaching the Bible differently, that's, that's not administration, is it? Right. But conducting business can be different. We don't all have to be the exact same. Then in verse 7, it starts talking about these gifts. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. The gifts of the Spirit were given to us to use for the ministry. And it says down here, uh, let's see, the prophet severally. Every man seeks severally as he will. Verse 11, dividing to every man severally as he will. Some of us get one gift, some of us get two gifts, some of us get all the gifts, right? What will you do with your gifts? Amen. The more you do with your gifts, I believe, the more the Lord will put on you. Because He will not put more on you than you can handle. Amen. And sometimes one gift is all you can handle. Right. And that doesn't mean that, you have, oh, I'm a weak Christian, I can only do one. Sometimes your gift is great, isn't it? Oh, I have the gift of, of music, and just every Sunday I'm, I'm singing and booked, and I just I don't have time for anything else. I have the gift of that. And that's all you need. That's all the Lord knows you need. But. The verse 8, it says, For one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. 
I looked those words up just to make sure they didn't mean something different and they mean exactly what you think they mean. It means the wisdom and the knowledge of man. It just means, oh, you see those people who are smart, smart as a man. They just know all the things, don't they? <laughs> then you see those people who have, who have wisdom. And those, those, those people are a little different. They know things, but it's because they've done some things. <laughs> Knowledge is up here. Wisdom, you can't learn wisdom. You have to experience wisdom. Amen. And that's the difference between those two words. Knowledge, I can read in a book and I can tell you things. But unless I've gone through that, I don't know those things. Right? Amen. And it says, uh, let's see, verse 9, to, to another faith by the same spirit, to another the gift of healing by the same spirit. Have you ever met someone that just had so much faith it was contagious? Almost annoyingly so. Mm -hmm. There's everything they did. Well, the Lord will take care of that. And you're thinking, well, yeah, but if this happens, what are you going to do? I'm that way. I'm afraid I don't have the gift of faith as much as I should. Because in my mind, when I think I'm going to do this, and if this happens, I'll do this. And if this happens, I'll do this. And every time I do something, it's like a decision ladder. You know, it's like a flow chart. If this happens, go here. If this happens, go here. If this happens, I'll go here. And I'm three or four deep before I ever go to pray or trust in the Lord. And sometimes we need to move that one. And every time we need to move that one. Why don't we say pray? We need to move it to the top right where there's a decision. And there's not really a tree, is it? It's more just, just the Lord will take care of that. We do the next right thing and the Lord will take care of the rest. And he'll show me the next bit when I need to get there. That's a, that's a, that's a gift. The gift of faith. To another, the gift of healing by the same spirit. Some people are just more gifted at that than others. Some people know all the remedies, which oils to use, which what, and all that stuff. I, I don't have that gift either. Some people just, get, medicine just makes more sense. Nurses and doctors, I've seen people flunk out of this course, and I've seen people go, that's pretty easy. It's a gift. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, divers' tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Miracles. That's mm -hmm. the one that gets everybody. Miracles, and from what I can look it up, according to Strong's and Thayer's, this means inherent power mm -hmm. given by, by a uh, spiritual source. I think this one for has, I'm not going to say it's completely gone away, but I think we don't see it as much as we used to. Mm -hmm. you, don't, I, you don't see people walking around and their shadows hitting people when they walk by anymore. All right. Why is that? I don't know. I don't think it matters. The point is that there is, that is, a, that is a spiritual gift, and the apostles had that spiritual gift. And to another prophecy, now that's another one that sticks a bunch of people. I've heard, of, so I know a few people who say that they have the gift of prophecy, and they want you to come tell you their dreams and all this and that and the other thing. But that word prophecy just does it exactly, it can mean you know, the, the prophets in the old, where they would have visions, and the Lord would directly talk to them, and they would say that, tell what the Lord said, the prophecy also you can just mean preaching. Right. Amen. The Lord gives if you if you have those here that have delivered know that the Lord will speak to you and the Lord will and he may not audibly, but he'll put something on your mind. And and, and then you, you'll study that out, and that is you just know that that's the message that the Lord has for you to deliver and the message that the congregation needs to receive. And I, I don't want to say that to make it seem all high and mighty about what we do, but it's that's, that's the gift of prophecy. Amen. Not all people have the gift of prophecy. To another, the discerning of spirits. Now, I look this one up. It says, judging whether one who is either, is judging one who is truly moved by God's spirit or falsely boasts that he is, knowing in whom a spirit is manifest or embodied, whether divine or demonical. Hmm. Have you ever met someone and you just knew that that wasn't a person you should be around? You just, right. Almost instantly when you meet these people, you know, don't you? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you can meet someone and you think, man, that's a brother, isn't it? Right. I met a guy, talked to a guy the other day outside the paint store, and uh, we just were talking, and he was Hispanic, so we were trying to talk a little bit in Spanish, and he asked me, he's on the to church, and he said, are you a big door or a little door person? <laughs> and uh, I saw him a little door person. He's talking about the gates to hell are wide and the straight and narrow path leads to heaven. And you just know about these people, the discerning of spirits. And it says, to another, diverse kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. 
I tried to look this up because I couldn't get my, my mind completely wrapped around it. I don't know that I still do it. There's, I've talked to three or four people and I've got three or four different answers. <laughs> but one of the explanations is diverse kinds of tongues mean inspired understanding of languages, meaning the Lord gives you inspiration and you can, you can speak that language. Interpretation of tongues is understanding of language by human means, meaning you have to study Spanish and you've got to slog through the verbs and the adjectives and all of that, and you've got to narrow it down by your own human means. I've talked to some people that means one means you can talk and one means you can interpret. I don't know. I do know that speaking languages is a gift. Mm -hmm. Amen. And there's some people I you know they speak 8, 10, 12 languages, no problem. They just walk past someone at Walmart, boom, they can speak a new language. You walk, and then you've got me who can spend a few years looking at the language and then be like, ha oh, uh, you know? <laughs> And it's, it, learning languages is a gift. Too bad. Everything that we do is a gift, can be a gift. If you can use it for the ministry, the Lord can make that your gift. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is the same, but we're all in the same spirit, aren't we? Verse 11 says, But all these worketh that one in the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. God gives every person talents as God knows who will bring glory to him. Amen. And then he starts in verse 12, he starts talking about the body and starts talking about the church. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of you know, that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Amen. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, or whether we be bond or free, and have all made have all been made, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Amen. For the body is not one member, but many. The church is not one person. The church yeah. isn't just a pastor. It isn't just you. It isn't just those people that sit across from you. It isn't the guy that sits in the sound booth. It isn't the person that brings the food every week. The church is made up of many members. Amen. And each and every member has a purpose within that church. The body is one and hath many members. And all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. Christ is also just one, isn't he? Amen. Mm -hmm. We all drink of the same spirit. If you're here and you're saved and you're part of that church, then you've all drank of the same spirit. The spirit of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ has washed you clean of your sins. Verse 15 says, If a foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the healing or hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? Amen. If you just have a hand or you just have a foot, that's not a body, is it? Mm -mm. If you just have smelling, you don't have anything else, do you? We can't all do the same thing in the church. That's it. It can't everyone all be preachers, can't everybody be Sunday school teachers, can't everybody be song leaders. And that's okay. That's it. Everyone has their own unique thing. And you know what? Your unique thing may not be may not be listed out in the Bible. You know, if you come and you mow the yard, you don't find it says Jesus mowed the yard, is it? And that's okay because your unique thing is the way you're serving the church is you mow the yard. Or your unique thing is that you know how the computer works and so you do the sound booth. Or you know how to lead songs and you do that. You play the piano and you do that. It's okay that you don't know how to do everything. Amen. Because if all were the hearing, where were the smell? And I don't know what part of the body you are in the church, but it doesn't matter. Because, and we'll get to that in a second, but it says the comedy parts don't need anything, but the uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. Verses uh, <clears throat> 20. But now are they many members, but yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the hand and the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be 
more feeble are necessary. Mm-hmm. In those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. Amen. There are no useless members, and everyone is needed. Sometimes our purpose in the church is just to show up on time and listen to what the Bible, what, what the preacher has for you. That's it. Because I can tell you, as not being a pastor, but I can tell you, in the son of a pastor, it's discouraging when nobody shows up. <laughs> It's discouraging whenever nobody shows up because you got up and you, it's raining a little bit. Well, it's okay. I won't go today. I'm listening online. It's discouraging whenever the people aren't there. Right. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12. Verses... 9 and 10, it says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress. For Christ's sake, when I am weak, then am I strong. Amen. You can't be strong unless you're weak. You can't have good unless there's bad. It's okay not to be the strongest member of the church. Is it? Mm-hmm. Because you know what? Because of that, you will strive to be better, and then you will be the strongest, and then that person won't be the strongest, and they will strive. Because iron sharpeneth iron, doesn't it? Amen. This, the church is to be there for an encouragement to its members. Mm-hmm. It's not to push someone down a rung, or to get your way up. It's to push that person up a rung, so you now, now you're up a rung, Right. It's okay that we're not all the same, and it's okay not to be the strongest and the best. Now, how do you determine who's the best? I don't know. Don't ask me that. I don't think that's really a biblical principle. I don't think there is the best and worst in the church. Anyway. But we all compare ourselves to other people, don't we? This is an yep. innate human thing that we do. Well, look at so-and-so. They brought in two crock pots instead of one. We so don't bring in three. You know? It's a, we all compare ourselves to one another, and the Bible says that the weak will be made strong. Now, is three crop pots weak? No. You, but I think you understand the point we're trying to make. Mm-hmm. Verse 25, it says that there should be no schism in the body and that the members should have the same care one for another. Mm-hmm. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. For one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, you are the body of Christ and members in particular. We are in bonds together. That's what I believe is Paul says in another portion of scripture. We are in bonds together. Mm-hmm. There should be no schism in the body. There shouldn't be a separation in the church, should it? We should be of the same spirit in Jesus. Is the, or the, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the Amen. spirit has been the same yesterday, today, and forever. There has never been a schism with God. There's never been a dividing between God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Father, has it? And there shouldn't be a schism in the church. That's right. And the Bible says, if you have ought against your brother, go to him and talk to him. If he will not listen to you, go and take another brother with you and talk to him. And if he still will not answer, bring him up before the church and have the church talk to him. The Bible says that we have these so that there will be no schism in the church. And I have seen schisms in churches before mm-hmm. because they didn't go and they didn't talk to their brothers the way mm-hmm. the Bible says. Right. And I tell you another another way that you have no schism in the church, and this is the not fun part, but it's um, um, excluding members. Discipline. Mm-hmm. If discipline is for the edification of that person, and so that there be no schism in the church. You discipline people not because you want to, and that's what I believe it is. First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, I believe the church was proud because they were going to be able to discipline this guy, and they were going to say, "You would go for her, get out." And they were happy, and they were proud to be able to cast that brother out. And Paul says, "No, you shouldn't be happy. This should be a very sad, very somber thing." Mm-hmm. And I believe, I believe it's in First Corinthians he does this. Don't hold me this, but I believe in Second Corinthians it's mentioned that this this gentleman is mentioned again. He's now a back part of members of that church. He got it right, and that should be the goal of discipline. That there be no schism in the body. 
And I'll leave this thought with you. You can take it and leave it. You know what the best form of discipline in the church is? Self-discipline. Mm -hmm. If you yeah. have self-discipline, you don't have to have church discipline. Right. And I'm going to leave that alone. Mm. Verse 28. Now, I'm going to go back to verse 27. Now, your body of, now you're in the body of Christ and members in particular. You're not here because of happenstance. Amen. If you think you're here because of happenstance, either you don't understand the Bible or you're in the wrong church. Right. Because you are members in particular. You are supposed to be in a particular church at the time that you're in. Man. If you no longer feel this is a church for you, you need to go and find the church the Lord has for you. Right. And I don't think your pastor will say, get mad at me for saying that. Nope. It's okay. You are to be members in particular within the body of Christ in that local body, wherever that is. Now, verse 28, and God has set some of the church first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healing, helps governments, diversities of tongues. This verse is also one of those confusing verses that I ran across. A lot of confusing verses in this chapter. There's different opinions on this. Some people believe this is the order in which the first church was, was added to. He, first the apostles were, and then he added prophets, and then he added teachers, etc., etc. Some people believe it's more of a hierarchy. The apostles in the church were first, secondarily prophets or preachers, and then teachers, and then miracles, gifts of healing, helps governments, etc., etc. I don't know which one it is, to be honest with you. I can't tell you. Mm. To me, it somewhat reads more of a hierarchy than it does those who were added first, but I can't be for sure. I've looked, and I've tried to look at other verses to tell you what, I, what exactly it says, and I can't tell you with any exactness. But I can tell you that God had set some in the church, and I think that's where it's at. God set some in the church. Amen. You can't be set in a universal, invisible church, can you? Nope. Never been to a universal, invisible church. I don't know where it's at. Are all apostles, are all prophets, verse 29, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? No, and that's okay. That's like it. Said before, your members in particular, and you're here for a specific person. For the body is not one member, but many. What is your purpose? What is your place in the church? Right. I believe that's an important question. And verse 31 says, But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. That word covet just means to desire strong. Mm -hmm. Desire earnestly the best gifts. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be better. There's nothing wrong with wanting to have other gifts. Mm -hmm. And Paul said, after that, yet I show to you a more excellent way. Mm -hmm. And what is the more excellent way? And I believe he starts right in verse, chapter 13 with that, doesn't he? Because verse 13 references the spirits or references the gifts of the Spirit. Chapter 13 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Amen. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and have all, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can move mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Mm -hmm. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, Yet profiteth me nothing. Right. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not in itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Amen. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. And so, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, and I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but from face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Amen. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. I believe the more excellent way is charity. Mm -hmm. I believe it's love. 
I believe the absence of love voids your gift. There you go. I believe if you are excellent at what you do, if you're good at medicine, if you're good at knowledge, you know all the things, if you're good at singing, and you say, look what I did. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I knew how to build that house, and I built it. I knew how to build that church, and I built it. I knew how to put a band-aid on that guy, and I put a band-aid on that guy. Look, look at how good I am. Mm -hmm. I think it means nothing. There you you're not doing it for the Lord. A haughty spirit, a personal ambition, and adoration of others, these mean nothing to the Lord. Do whatever you do to the Lord. In Colossians 3.23, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. We're to love one another in the church. I think, especially among our kinds of churches, we get so scared about love because uh, that's one of the other. That's one of the things that everyone else is taking from us, right? When you flip on the, the TV preachers, the radio preachers, all they talk about is wealth, prosperity, and love, and that's all you get, right? All the, the feel good stuff. There you go. And I think we've become so scared to preach about love and the importance of love that we've we've backed off from it. There you go. Hell and brimstone has become easy to preach because it's, it's what you do to be different, right? But I think the more excellent way is to love one another. Mm -hmm. John chapter 13, verse 35 says, By this all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Amen. That's how you knew you were a disciple of Jesus during that time, because they loved one another. Turn with me to 1 Peter, if you will. 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not bringing evil for evil or railing or for not, sorry, or railing for railing, but come Contrywise, blessing, knowing that ye are where thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. Amen. In the verse ten it says, "For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips, that they speak no God. Let him eschew evil and do no and do good, but and let him seek peace and ensue it." Mm -hmm. Verse 8, finally, be of one mind, be of the same spirit, having compassion one to another, love as brethren, be piteous and be, be pitiful and be courteous. Be pitiful one to another. Mm. Be courteous one to another. But pitiful doesn't mean, all. Oh, how are you doing today? No, it means having compassion one to another. Amen. Hey, you had a bad week, man, I'm right there with you. Because, you know, if one of us suffer, we all suffer. Mm -hmm. It's been a bad week. You've been tempted this week. I understand. Let me tell you about my week. We get so caught up in trying to be perfect for everyone that we see that we forget to be human. You're going to be tempted. That's not the sin. The sin is not being tempted. The sin is succumbing to that temptation. Jesus was tempted. That isn't a sin. You're going to be tempted. Right. That's an assurance. It doesn't matter where you go. The sin is succumbing to that. You know how you can refrain from succumbing? Is you can go to the church and say, man, pray for me this week. Mm -hmm. There's this new guy at work, and he's just, I just think we need to pray for him. I don't think he's saved. I think he's been doing this and that and the other thing. Just pray for me. Help me get through this. Mm -hmm. Or pray that he'll go to another department or something, that he'll be out of my life, you know? First John chapter 4 says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Mm -hmm. And this word love is the agape love. It's not any of the other loves that we see in the, in the Greek and Hebrew languages. It's agape, which is the love that God has for us. That's literally what that word means. It means it's the most supreme sort of love. Mm -hmm. It's a love that is sacrificial that is God gave his only begotten son. That he so should believe on him should not perish. God didn't come to the world, Jesus didn't come to the world to condemn the world, did he? But that the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's right. Do we share that love? Do we share with other people that love? When you when you're when you're married, you share that love that your spouse gives you, right? Hey, she, you know, oh, he got me flowers, she made me lunch today. You know, people know that, that you like each other, don't they? Do people know that Jesus loves you? Right. Do people know that you love Jesus? 
Or do we quench the spirit sometimes and we think, well, I'll get to it later. He probably knows. It's okay. It's not a big deal. Well, yeah, they go to that church down the road. They don't, they're, not, they're not, you know, five out of five, but they'll do. <laughs> no, that's not what the Bible says. John chapter 15, if you will. John chapter 15 and starting in verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, and he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for servants knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Amen. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he shall give it you. These things I command you, that you love one another. He says it Amen. twice, doesn't he? You know why he says it twice? Because it's important. Because it's hard, isn't it? It can be hard to love one another. And you, henceforth I call you not servants, for the servants know it's not what the Lord does, but I've called you friends. Not only that, we're not just the friends, we're the adopted son, aren't we? The yeah. adopted daughter. And this has struck me the last little bit, and I'm sure Michaela's tired of hearing me say it, because I said it the last several times I preached. But you know what's different about an adopted child and a regular and a, a biological child? The adopted child is chosen. You don't have to adopt anybody, do you? Right. You choose that that child. That child is wanted. Mm-hmm. Praise the Lord. He wanted me. Get mad. Praise the Lord. I'm an adopted child of the king. Salvation is a wonderful thing. And if you have it, you know that. And it can be easy to forget how wonderful it is. Because sure. when you have it good, you forget how good you have it, right? Because mm -hmm. it can always be better. No matter where you're at, it can always be better. We forget that can always be worse, too, Dave. Because we don't think about that. For I came out of the world to condemn it. Jesus didn't come here to send you to hell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe on him should not perish. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He endured hell, the absence of God, so you would not have to. <laughs> oh, I don't know that I have the love in me to give my life for a whole lot of people. Much less, I don't have any kids, but I couldn't imagine sending them to do it instead of me. The power of that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. For those of you that have kids, just think about that. Would you sacrifice your child so that others might live? What a somber thought, isn't it? Would you sacrifice anybody so that other people might live? God did. Right. He sent his son to die on the cross, something we may try because we just said, no, you got to Jesus died on the cross. No. Somebody died. That thought gets me the more I think about it because if you think about it that way, at least to me, God put it for me, it, it's more somber. Somebody died so that I could live. Somebody died so that I could be adopted so that I could inherit the kingdom of God. Eternal life, eternal presence with the Lord. You know, and again, it's another thought that hit me pretty recently. Uh, when you get to heaven, the Bible says you'll know all things. And the Bible says when you get to heaven, you'll sit at the feet of Jesus continually praising him. Amen. And I always thought, what a waste of all that knowledge you get when you get to heaven. What's the point of knowing everything if all you do is you just sit and praise the Lord? And then the Lord saves me. <laughs> and I realized. Once we know all things, we'll know how much he did for us. Amen. And all we'll want to do, not that all that we'll have to do, 
All we'll want to do is sit at the feet of Jesus and praise Him and thank Him for what He did for Amen. us. Amen. Right. I know I'm behind the curve on that one, but it's just the last little bit. That's what I thought. I'm, I've been thinking about this. I was thought of ways and I thought, oh my goodness, I won't want to do anything else. Mm -hmm. mm. Jesus died so that you could live, and if you confess your sins and believe on Him and put your faith and trust in Him, you can, you will be saved. You bet. Turn with me, if you will, to, to Romans, where the brother was at this morning, Romans chapter 5. Don't worry, I'm not going to preach Sunday school again. But the first part of that chapter says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. By whom also we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I tell you something else too. When I was, uh, I had heard a, a brother preach the other day that I never, I didn't realize until he brought it out. But that word "hope" in the Bible, it's not like we hope for something. You know, as a kid when you're going home from the store, I hope we stop for ice cream, hope we go to McDonald's, something that may or may not happen. Right? Hope I get a raise this, this quarter. No, that's not what the word hope means. The word hope means you have faith in something that will happen. Amen. It isn't this flimsy thing. It's a 50-50. It's when your parents say maybe you hope it happens. No. Hope in the Bible means I have faith that it will happen. Uh, what does it say in Hebrews? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. That verse has always confused me. I've never understood that in the last little bit. I've been thinking about it, thinking about it, and I just couldn't get my head wrapped around it. And then the brother said that faith is the substance of things hoped for because hope isn't just like a flimsy, I hope this happens. Faith is, I have faith that this will happen. Faith is the substance of hope. It is what hope is made of. Amen. It's faith and the evidence of things not seen. <sighs> Verse 3 in Romans chapter 5 says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing the tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope, and hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And hope maketh not a shame. Amen. Don't be ashamed for the sake of the gospel. Don't be ashamed for what you believe. Because someone loves you enough to send a son to die that you might not. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for the adventure for a good man's son would even dare to die. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Amen. But God commended his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We would not love him except for that he loved us first. Left to your own devices, there's no reason for you to go to God because only because God just says you're a sinner and you're going to hell. And nobody wants to be told that. Right. In man, his natural state, in the carnal mind, is an enmity with God. There's no reason to go to God and know yourself. And if you're here and you're saved, you know that. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to go to God and know yourself. Because you know if you go to Him, you're going to hell. And that's a just God. You, the wages of sin is death. <laughs> On payday, you get paid, right? When you work your 40 hours, you get 40 hours worth of pay. And when you sin at the end of the week or the end of your life, you pay day yet, you get paid, don't you? The wages of sin is death. Not only physical death, but spiritual death. The eternal death, the lake that never stops burning. Mm -hmm. That's the wages of sin. And God right. is just and absolutely he'll send you there. Because he's a just God. Praise the Lord, he's a merciful God. And he's a loving God, too. And you know, uh, in pre-talking about this tonight in the Spanish ministry, 
God is God does not have attributes. God God's attributes for us, how we would say it, we have compassion. We have love. God is love. God is compassion. These attributes that we have, that we ascribe to God, it isn't that God has them, it's that He is those things. <laughs> they are the the he, they inhabit him or he inhabits them. There is no schism with God. There is, it's, it's kind of like a puzzle. You know, God is not like a puzzle. There isn't the puzzle piece of love, and there isn't the puzzle piece of compassion and long suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith. No, God is all love. God is all compassion, is all gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance. Even his garment had no, no seam, right? That was one. And there is one God. Those are two different things. There's only one God, and God is only one. So God is love. God doesn't have love. Right. When you love somebody, you love them like God. And that is to be love in that person's life. Verse 9 says, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Justified through faith. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith, the gift of faith. I think if you're saved, you have to have the gift of faith to some degree. You may not have it as much as someone else, but you have to have the gift of faith right. to be saved. Because you don't have to have faith to know that Jesus exists. There's enough empirical, historical evidence to know that Jesus exists. You don't have to have faith to believe in the cross. There's enough historical, empirical evidence to believe that the cross exists. You can go see one in Israel, right? You can go see a cross. You've seen the pictures. There's enough evidence out there. There's enough belief in what you've been taught that you can just believe it. And no, no faith is required. And so the, the, the prerequisite amount of faith you have to have in the person that taught you, right? But to have faith, to understand mm -hmm. that it happened for me, that it happened, somebody, Jesus, not somebody, Jesus came down mm -hmm. from heaven and became flesh. Jesus went from perfection to nothingness. Mm -hmm. He went from perfection to a world full of sin, corrupted by sin. By, in the next verse, I think the brother gets to, for by one man's offense, death reigned by one much more they which received abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in the life by one Jesus Christ, for by one man's offense, death reigned. And it ain't got any better since. It's just exponentially got worse since that. And Jesus came down to the sin ridden world and perfect. And fulfill the law. Amen. By the death of the testator, a new testament can be written. The, new, the old testament had to have blood sacrificed mm -hmm. to it. And Jesus came and fulfilled that and shed his blood. Amen. And by the blood, the new testament could be written because the blood of the testator had already been spilled. We're under the new testament, the testament of faith, of grace. If you're here, you're saved. If not, you're here and you're lost. You're under the Old Testament because the blood has not been shed for you. And you're not under the blood of the New Testament. And the wages of sin is death. Mm -hmm. Finally, you will turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promise mm -hmm. let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some in, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works Good works aren't bad, are they? 
They're good works. Nothing wrong with good works. Good works is a phrase that makes everybody tense up every time we say it. Oh, oh no. He's one of those. But good works are part of it, aren't they? After you're saved. Mm-hmm. Don't mean a thing in the world before you're saved. Because you can't please God. But afterwards, you're his workmanship. We're his workmen. Oh my goodness. Working in my shame. Oh, no. Ephesians. For we're grace to say through faith and ourselves a gift of God for work. For we're his workmanship. Crazy. Oh my goodness. I'm so sorry. I cannot say that right now. Ephesians chapter 2. It's okay. I know you're all saying it in your head, but I got to say it. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of the works as any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus of two good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Amen. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Good works. Oh, what's this? just like when somebody starts talking about the rainbow, you just like, oh, which way are you going to go with this? <laughs> We've been just like love. We've let we've let other religions and other people and other groups they've taken away all the symbols that we hold dear. Right, and that's not by accident. Right, the devil said that one's important. Let me take away the promise of God. Let me take away good works of God. Let me take away the love of God. The devil's attacking the churches, but you know what the Bible says: the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. But the devil's going to keep it. You know what? In a few years, we won't be able to say something else. Right. In a few years, we won't be able to do something else until the Lord returns. He's going to try to take everything away from us. I think, I think, I think something else is taking away the praise that I think that, that the, the church used to have. I think he's taking that away too. Mm-hmm. And he give that to the Holy Rollers and the Babacostals and all the others. Let's just let's, let's take something good and put a spin on it. Because nothing is new under the sun. Amen. Solomon says. And so he just keeps taking, he, you know, that they, what does they say? No, no myth is based entirely in fiction. There's always a little bit of truth in there. Mm. I think same with religions. Mm. Someone took a kernel of truth and they spun a bunch of lies around it. And when you ask them about it, they just point at that one kernel of truth. And they say, well, we believe this. Mm-hmm. And you go, well, that's good. I believe that too. And they suffer a bunch of people in. Mm-hmm. The Catholics, oh, we believe in the church. Look, we got Peter right there in the middle. Jesus built his church on Peter. Remember that verse? It doesn't matter that those two rocks mean two completely different things in the original language. We just let, we let so much be taken away from us because just like the children of Israel, when we got the new land, they didn't they didn't go through and take conquer everyone, did they? Right. And we let people take stuff from us because it's easier. Well, I'll go conquer the rock hill full of giants later. And then you know what happens later? You got a war in Israel. Mm-hmm. You know what happened to all those people? They didn't go anywhere. They're still in the promised land. Right. And they're still making a habit now as they just like they did then. Right. Don't be scared if the Bible teaches it. And I don't know, I don't, I don't think it's mentioned in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, they dance. And now that's just the sin, sin that ever was. But Miriam danced and they praised the Lord. They had, mm-hmm. they had uh, what is that called? They got the, what am I trying to say about Tambourine. Tambourines. Miriam had a tambourine and danced. That's in the Bible. But yet, if someone, if I came up here and had a tambourine and was singing Amazing Grace, you would just throw me out as quick as you could, couldn't you? <laughs> We've let people take so much away from us. You know, what the, you know what the Bible says about all of this? Let all things be decent and in order. Right. When we went to Peru, we danced. Okay? Don't tell anybody. We danced. It was just one of their customs they had. And the, all the, all the visiting, visitors and all the preachers are going to be preaching, they get up and you dance. Now, and I danced with so we just held hands and slid in a circle to some music. But you know what? They had an order to it. I didn't know it, but they did. Is that wrong that they did that? No. Did they do that to praise and serve the Lord? Absolutely. I didn't fault them for it. The brothers that are coming up from Peru to go to Mexico right now, they're not going to be 
docked for that. They're not going to be told not to do that. You know what? They're going to be taught the Bible. They're going to be taught what the Bible says. So in conclusion, the Bible says there is no schism and there should not be a schism in the Bible. It's okay to be different. We all have the same spirit. The Bible, what the Bible says is what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. and that's all that matters. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you believe. I can tell you what the Bible says, and that's all that matters. That's the one that says, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. And you know what? What you hold good might be a little different than what I hold good. You know why? Because the Bible gives us the core of what we believe, and you have to go off what the Lord has given you for your life. Because we're all different people. And I'll use my two famous examples. I know I have friends that don't play playing cards. They don't play with ace, king, queen playing cards. Couldn't tell you why, I just know they don't. And that's okay. They have proven that that is good in their service. And I don't fault them for it. I don't have a thing in the world wrong with the hand around me. I like playing with playing cards and I don't see anything wrong with it. That's, I've proven that right. I don't have a problem with that. When I play those cards, I don't summon devils or demons and I'm okay. I've got other friends who don't go to movie theaters. They just will not step foot in the movie house. That's okay. When I go, I don't invite them. They've proven that to be good in their service to the Lord. Why? I don't know. It's none of my business. They've proven that right. And if you're here and you have a belief and you've proven it right and it doesn't go against the Bible, nothing wrong. Just because not everyone agrees with you doesn't mean a thing in the world. We're not to offend brethren. So just because everyone's given out meat to idols and to... You know, to people like me and Peppa, that's just free food sitting there when everybody leaves. <laughs> but if somebody sees me doing it and that offends them, what does the proverb say? A wounded brother is harder to win back than a fortified city. Mm -hmm. Better leave that free meat alone, right, Peppa? Mm -hmm. Don't be a stumbling block to the weaker vessels. Right. We're called to lift each other up. The Bible says that the weak will be made strong. This means we need to kick everyone. Oh, you're too strong. Let's kick you down and make you let you be strong again. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says to lift each other up. Amen. What is our place in the church? I think each and every one of us have uh, some prerequisites that we all have to do, that we all should want to do. But after you take, just like college, after you take those prerequisites, then you got to choose your specialized field, right? You want to be a doctor, you want to be an accountant, you want to be this. And that's okay. Prerequisites to be in the church is to be saved, to believe in Jesus, that he died for your sins, to be baptized into the church. Then it's up to you and the Lord to figure out what your place in that church is. I can't tell you what your place is. Can't tell you where your hand or an eye or nose and ear, left toe or what. Not my place. I don't really believe it's pastor's place either. It's right. between you and God. And whether or not you follow, that's on you. But I tell you that uh, quenching the spirit in the church in a church like this just will affect everybody if you want to do what you're called to do. Yeah. Aiken uh, took a Babylonian garment and his whole family died. Mm -hmm. And uh, since the fire alive, their family died. And that little widow woman, she did what she was supposed to do. Right. I just can't help but feel that she and her whole village had bred that whole drought, that whole family. You're called to something, do it. The Lord will make it all right. Mm-hmm. What is our place in the church? Go ahead. Right.